Two, this is one. Radio check on uniform. How copy? Two, how you Lima Charlie? Uh, awesome. Let's get the eight us up at two seven zero point one. Also, Ops is going to be calling ahead to tower for us when we step. So don't bother calling for startup anymore. Uh, after you've got the eight, us get the HQ up and contact me on three two point five. Oh, and one last thing to remember: if you've got all the frequencies noted down on your keyboard. So if in doubt. Roger, Wilco. Nine five nine. Runways in U zero three left. Two one left. Expect visual approach. Acknowledge receipt of information kilo and advise aircraft type on first contact. Nellis Air Force Base information kilo. Time zero one one five. Wind zero two eight at ten. Visibility greater than ten miles. Clear. Temperature 26, dew point 13, altimeter 2959, runways in U03 left, 21 left, expect visual approach, acknowledge receipt of information kilo and advise aircraft type on first contact. Pull up, pull up. Altitude, altitude.
If this is one, radio check, Fox Mike. I get you five by five, Kermit. Hey, while we're at it, let's see if Victor works fine. Push one two four point six, and let me know once you're there. Pushing one two four point six. And there. Ready. Okay, double two, radio check, Victor. Roger, Raging Lima, Charlie. Very good. Go ahead and finish. Start up and hit me up when you're ready for taxi. Yeah, copy that. Two, one is ready for taxi. Copy, let me contact ground and let them know we're good to go. Raj.
And two is rolling. Looks like those Eagles are getting ready for a pretty big mission. Yep. I assume if we go back to the Persian Gulf, the Eagles are going to be one of the first aircraft in right behind seed after they clear a path. More than likely, they're going to be hitting command center, staging areas, and supply lines. Just like they did in Iraq. But if I remember correctly, back then they were just entering service. They didn't even have targeting pods installed on all the jets. They dropped a lot of Mark 82s under a constant hail of enemy AAA. I read a few books and everyone was amazed about the sheer volume of what Saddam had on the ground. Now it's trial by fire for the F-15E and her crews. Some of their missions were pretty hairy, others weren't so bad. This time will be different though if we go back to that side of the world. Both sides will be using a lot more precision guided munitions like paveways and J-dams. That is, until it's safe enough to get low and dirty with the gun. Conflict like this, our enemy is going to be better equipped and prepared, unlike what we're seeing in OEF and OIF. Raj, so much for the you don't need the oxygen mask part. Devil 1 2, contact tower at 327.7.
One, holding short, zero three left, up on tower. Dallas Tower, double one flight, holding short, four zero three left, ready for departure. Double one, Dallas Tower, winds are zero two eight for one zero, cleared for takeoff runway zero three left, please expedite your departure. Clear for takeoff runway zero three left, and we'll hurry it up for you. Double one. All right, currently go ahead and enter the active, and without stopping, get lined up and feed the power in and take off. Watch the instruments and reject the takeoff if you need to. I'll be a few seconds behind you. Raj. One rolling. Warning, autopilot. Devil 1, Nellis departure, radar contact. Clear to resume on navigation. Clear for on navigation, Devil 1. Alright, let's climb to Angel 10, speed up and maintain 220 and hit. 1, climbing to Angels 1 0 and maintaining 220 indicated. Behind the jet. 
I asked during the briefing to include the schematics in your kneeboard for reference, so if you're unsure, just use that, okay? Thanks. If I need it, I'll flip over to it. So, where do we start on the nav? Cool. And with that, I'll get off my soapbox. Okay, back to the task at hand. We will quickly go through the main instruments and panels used for navigation. So we'll start with the navigation mode select panel, or NMSP, and talk about the HSI, JDI, and then turn to the right console and talk about the auxiliary avionics panel, or AAV. We will also cover the basics of the autopilot and HUD today, and focus in a bit more on the details tomorrow. Ready? I'm all ears. Alright, so first the NMSP, which you will find behind the aforementioned stick. Here you will choose the primary source used for your navigation. Your two sources are HARS, also known as Heading and Altitude Reference System, or the HICI, the GPS INS navigation system. You can also quickly switch between the different points you will want to use as your destination or reference, such as Steer Point, Anchor Point, TACAN, or ILS. Good so far? Yeah, we had something similar in the A-10A. Okay, gotcha. So the HSI, or Heading Selector Indicator, is located just above it, and I guess it didn't change that much. I'd say this is one of the most useful instruments, and it has a lot of features, which will make your life easier both during flying from point A to B and during combat. We'll be returning to it in quite a few forthcoming sorties. Ready to move on? Hey, firm. I saw quite a few new cool features in the sim. Good, I'm sure you'll love them. Okay, moving back up, you'll find the ADI, or Attitude Directional Indicator. This is your artificial horizon and will be very useful for your ILS landing, amongst other things. Raj. On to the right console. Obviously, the most important piece of navigation equipment we have over here is going to be the CDU. It is one of the more advanced and complex pieces of equipment we have in the Charlie. Did you take your time and go through the descriptions of all the pages and functions? Yeah, I read all of it. Really, no shit. Well, during a normal sort, you will be using less than 10% of it, but it's good that you did it, and you should do it at least once. There are true jewels hidden between all the bit and test pages, which we'll come back to that. Okay, so just below the CDU, you will find the AAP, where you will power up the CDU and Iggy. The two dials below are handy for quickly displaying CDU info about your steer point, waypoint, or current position, and for determining whether you will be using the waypoint database for your flight plan, mark points, or all of it. Take a look at these. Okay, sounds easy enough.
Warning, autopilot. Why would I want to change anchor point from bullseye to another waypoint? Imagine you're working with ground troops and you want to be able to quickly locate targets called by them. You may want to set their position as an anchor point. Or you're working with assets from other countries that don't normally use MGR escorts. Say, for example, some French jets or maybe helicopters. Then you want to choose a waypoint that is common for both of you as the anchor point. You want more examples?
Alright, I'm ready. Okay, cool. We only have a few things left that we need to cover on the NMSB, so there's a switch called the PT4 switch. It's in the middle of the panel and this will stow or enable the yellow pitch bank steering bar and the course warning flag on the ADI. There are also two lights on the right of the panel. They are for indicating the activation of the UHF and FM radio's homing function, respectively. These features make your radios an additional source of navigation by homing in on the signal transmitted on whatever frequency you have dialed in. This is a handy feature which is most commonly used during CSAR missions. Anything else on the NMSP, or can we move on? Yeah, what about the tizzle button? Shit, forgot about that one. So, tizzle, well, we don't use it anymore. Raj? Another thing which I should have mentioned earlier is the difference between a waypoint and a steer point. So, the CDU can store up to 2,050 waypoints, but unless one of them is selected as your steer point, no steering or navigational data will be displayed in your HUD, TAD, or HSI. So in a nutshell, a steer point is the waypoint or mark point you currently have selected, making it your destination. Make sense? Absolutely. Right on. Okay, another new feature for the Charlie is autopilot. Actually, we should have covered it in the beginning as it's very handy for you to fly straight and check all your instruments as I describe them, but it seems you've already figured it out. Actually, we had it on the Alpha. What? The autopilot. Last was introduced on later versions of the A-10A. Roger. Anyhow, it's on my list, so we need to go through it. So, fireworks here, it's as simple as it gets. The autopilot switch is located just below the throttle set on the lacy control panel and has three basic functions that will enable you to keep your current altitude, heading, or moving. So let's go through the autopilot three functions one by one. Ready? Can't wait. So starting with the basic mode, which you're going to find pretty useful for cruising, we need to make sure that we're flying straight and level or pretty near it. Then we'll put the autopilot switch in the middle position, mark ELT. Altitude and heading hold, and press the button mark to engage and disengage located just to the left of it. You can also use the button on the left throttle. And one last thing before I forget, you should make sure that the jet is pretty well trimmed out before you set the autopilot. If you're too far out of trim, it will make the Morning, autopilot, autopilot. Go, which is a bit annoying. And with that, go ahead and engage the autopilot, and let me know once you got her on. Autopilot is engaged. Warning, autopilot. Okay, indication that the autopilot is on on the left side of the HUD, and you should get the chime in the helmet indicating that your autopilot is engaged. This mode is useful for cruising, especially if you fly in the lead position or are in route formation. You should go without saying, but never use any autopilot mode when flying in close formation as a wingman. Great. On to the second mode. Place the autopilot switch in the forward position, marked path.
Okay, it disconnected. Perfect. So as you can see, you can add in some small, minute, manual control inputs while autopilot is engaged. But anything much more than that, the autopilot will disco. Now this is handy if you need to make a quick, split-second reactionary maneuver, then you don't have to think about and take the time to hit a button to disconnect the autopilot. Huh, imagine that.
Devil One's on the new course. Ready to continue. Good. You will see that the bearing needle points directly towards waypoint three. However, the middle part of the arrow is way to the left. This is a course deviation indicator, which tells you how closely you are following the desired course. Since we turned long before reaching waypoint two, we are left of the desired flight path, and the eye is to the right from the bearing needle. Worry about it too much as we'll cover it in detail tomorrow. Actually, it may be that your CDI is all the way to the right. If that's the case, just switch your waypoint back to 2 and then return to waypoint 3. Now the CDI should be on the correct side. This is all connected with the waypoint attributes, and as I've said, this is for tomorrow's training. Uh, where was I? Ah, uh, yeah. The two dots to the left and the right are used to show you how far away from the desired currently are, and the scale can be set in the waypoint trip. Now on to the two knobs below the HSI. The left one is called the heading set knob, and it moves the heading marker around the compass. The marker looks like two closely set white squares. You can use it to mark a number of things like the wind direction or desired attack heading. It's not connected to any other instruments and has to be set manually. Go ahead and check it now, let me know when you're ready to move on. Seems quite handy. The second knob is the course set knob, right? Correct. It allows you to set the selected course in the window on the top right and move the course arrow around the compass card. You'll want to use it when setting up for landing or if you want to arrive at a specific waypoint coming from a certain direction, which we will cover and talk about when we get to the waypoint of trip. Copy that. And the numeric window on the top left is the range indicator. A firm given a nautical mile. So the last thing we need to cover here are the two small triangles just next to the aircraft symbol and along the intended course line. They indicate the course the aircraft will fly to or away from the selected TACAN station or steer point. Ready for the next part? Yes, two is good to go. All right, man. Now that we've got some of the things up front figured out, let's move over to the right console and dip into the CDU, starting with the AAP panel, which controls it. Sounds good. All right, so let's move over to the AAP panel now, which you're going to find just below the CDU. We'll start with the knob on the right, known as the page select dial. By default, it should be set to the other position, which enables data input into the while the other three positions are for read only. These selections will allow minor changes to what is displayed, but you would be unable to edit anything. So the important thing to remember here is, if you want to change any waypoint setting or attribute, this knob has to be in the other position. Copy. Yep, other for display and the rest is for data editing. Got it. Whoa, let's back it up there, high speed. Other is for editing, and all the remaining selections are for display. You had it backwards. Sorry about that. I copied all, but my mouth is quicker than my brain sometimes. Well, so long as we got it now. Okay, so now let's go ahead and check the position and steer settings using the page select rotary dial. In the position setting, you'll see a lot of useful information displayed on the CDU and CDU repeater if you have a pulled up on an MFCD. Position will display your current location in both lat long and MGRS, your speed, magnetic variation, altitude, and outside air temperature. You can cycle between indicated true and ground speed here as well as Celsius and Fahrenheit for the temperature. Any questions at this stage? Yeah, could you tell me a bit more about the MGRS? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. I'm guessing you don't use it too much in the civilian side, so you may have gotten a little bit rusty on that front. I'll actually take this opportunity and we'll go over two systems, UTM and MGRS. So UTM is a grid square 100 by 100 kilometers across and consists of a number from 1 to 60 and a letter. It wasn't precise enough for our needs, though, so MGRS was in the way MGRS works is pretty straightforward. The first set of digits determines how far the chosen point is to the east 
from the southwestern corner of the UTM grid square. The second set is how far north it is. So a full 10 digit coordinate has one meter precision. Now that's close enough to confidently put a JDAM on target without ever having seen it. Pretty cool, eh? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Thanks for the explanation. I'd appreciate going through differences between ground, true, and indicated speed once again. Okay, so in order to fully explain this, we first need to do some math with lots of brackets and square roots. But I'll try to do this in a simplified way. Indicated airspeed, or IAS, is the speed reading uncorrected for instrument, position, and other errors. Basically, it's your pitot tube reading, and it's usually calibrated to reflect the pressure at sea level. Now, true airspeed is the actual speed of air going over the wings of the aircraft. Now, in order to get it, you take your indicated airspeed and add corrections for position error, instrument error, compressibility error, and density error. Finally, ground speed is your speed in relation to the ground and not the air. You get it by taking true airspeed and adding or subtracting the wind speed. Note the ground speed only common reading for planes traveling at different altitudes. So if you want to synchronize your speed with other assets, use ground speed for that. Lastly, and most importantly, we use indicated airspeed for all of our performance data. So our takeoff, landing, stall, and all of your other speeds will be in terms of indicated airspeed. So magnetic variation is around 12 degrees in these parts? Hey firm, I realize you probably already know all of this, but since you asked, I'll go over it anyway. So magnetic variation is the difference between magnetic north, or the direction a magnetic compass needle points to, and true north, which is the direction along the meridian towards the north pole. If it's east from true north, then it is positive, West, then the deviation is negative. So you'll notice on some missions, other assets will give you bullseye calls using true north rather than magnetic. When this happens, you will have to add or subtract the variation from the given heading in order to create an offset point. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Ready to move on. Alright, staying on the AAP, the sphere setting will give you all of the important information about your current sphere point. The image in the left column shows the image, or desired magnetic heading, which is wind correct. Below that, you will find the distance, elevation, and bearing to the sphere point, which can also be changed to show the radial from the sphere point on which you currently fly. Got it. The right column shows time to go and desired time on target. The second option is especially useful if you want to coordinate with other assets. Plan on practicing it in one of the coming sorties. If you set up a desired time on target, you will also be shown a speed required to arrive at exactly the specified time. Finally, you can see the current wind strength and direction. Have a look at it and let me know when you're ready to move on. Okay, ready to move on. Now on to the Waypoint Info page. Go ahead and switch your AAP page select switch to this position, and let me know when you're there. Done. So this is a handy way to display the magnetic heading, distance, and time to go to three different points. The top right will show that information for the currently set waypoint, bottom right is for the anchor point, while the bottom left gives you information about the steer point. The lines on the left side allow you to select the waypoint or mark point by either entering its number or letter, or by using the scratch pad to type in the name. And that's all for the right knob. When you're ready, let me know and we'll move on to the steer point dial. Okay, good to go. Okay, now we will briefly cover the flight plan fundamentals. So take a look at the left 
Elektronov on the AAP. This is known as the gear point dial, and it should be in the flight plan position. In this mode, you will see the whole flight plan displayed on the tab, with waypoints connected by a green line. These green lines connecting waypoints together are known as waypoint lines for some weird reason. You may need to decrease the scale of your tab or zoom out to see the entire flight plan. Now, in order to do so, you first have to make it soy by long pressing the coolie hat on your throttle to the left or right, depending on which MSCP is currently displaying the tag. Or, you can soy the tag by pressing whichever OSB corresponds to where it says pad. After you have the tag set as soy, then press down on the data management switch Warning, or EMS down on the stick to increase the range and zoom out. Conversely, pressing up will decrease the range. So I'd like you to now move the zoom out on the tad until you can see your flight plan in its entirety and give me a heads up when you're caught up. Okay, I decreased the scale of the tad to the point that I could see my entire flight plan. Right on. The CDU will default into automatic flight plan sequencing. In this mode, the waypoints will automatically switch to the next one once you pass the previous one. There are applications where this is not desirable, and we'll go over them later on. Following so far? Yeah. If I'm tracking, and as I understand it, in this mode, the TAD will only display waypoints that are part of the flight plan, right? Even if I have more waypoints stored in the CDU? Exactly. Remember that the system can store up to 2,050 waypoints with those numbered 1 through 50 called mission waypoints. The rest, numbering 51 through 2,050, are called navigation waypoints. You will notice that part of the navigation waypoints are already assigned to airfields and cannot be edited, but we'll get back to that on tomorrow's story. On top of all that, we also have our mark points, which are labeled with letters. These will go from A to Z while allowing you to use 25 of the available 26 letters. Oh, and one more thing to remember, that when in flight plan mode, you will only be able to move through the waypoints which are part of the flight plan. So you won't be able to set anything that is not in the flight plan as your steer point. Why can't you use all 26? I didn't catch that. One more time, please. Yeah, why can we use only 25 out of 26? I guess that I should have said you can only add up to 25 mark points manually. Mark point Zulu is set automatically as a marker for the site of your last weapon deployment. Mark point Z is a very handy thing, but that is a lesson for another day. Okay, copy that. Now, if you want to display mark points, you're going to need that left selector knob in the middle position labeled, you guessed it, mark. You should not have any mark points stored in the system at this point, but we'll cover their use on another sortie, as they are mostly used for marking targets. Alright, got it. The third position is marked mission, and it will give you access to your entire waypoint database. Go ahead and move the switch into the mission position now, please. Done. Good. Take a look at your TAD. You'll see the green line has disappeared, and all of the mission waypoints are shown. Now, we haven't added any additional waypoints to those that were part of your original flight plan, so the total number remains the same. As you can see, the navigation waypoints are not displayed in this mode, but you can cycle through them. There are many ways to do that, but we'll use the remaining button on the AAP, which we have not covered so far, the steer point toggle switch. By pressing it up or down, you can Okay, now let's just set us my steer point now. Word. To wrap up today's training sortie, let's talk about the HUD.
before we do that though, let's turn back towards Sally. So pull up and turn towards waypoint four. Return to Angel 10 and let's try and keep 220 and city. Warning, autopilot. is on course for MOPA and at Angels 10. Let's talk about those HUD things. Fair enough. So I left this lesson for the end. I don't think there's a big difference between the HUD and the Alpha and Charlie, so we can go over it pretty quickly. Still, I have to go through the parts important for navigation, just to be sure no stones are left unturned. So when you're ready, let's do it. Yes, two is ready. Alright, here we go. First, let's talk about the total velocity vector, or TVV, which looks like a circle with three lines extending outward. It shows the aircraft's inertial velocity vector, or, using English, the point towards which the aircraft is heading, hence its other name, the flight path marker. Copy. I'm aware of both names for it. Good deal. You probably already also know that in windy conditions, and especially with a high crosswind component, the TBV may skew to one side of the HUD. This is completely normal, and it tells you that the plane is not going in the direction which the nose is pointing. Yeah, copy. Okay, the flight path ladder and heading tape do not need any further explanation. On the left you can see your airspeed, which depending on the settings can be displayed as indicated. Ground speed, indicated by a letter G or true airspeed, which will have a letter T displayed next to it. Now, on the right side of the HUD, you'll see the barometric altitude in feet. In nav and air-to-air -air mode, it will also show you the uncorrected CACD reading. In CCIP and CCRP mode, it will be corrected for installation errors, non-standard temperatures, and non-standard pressures, and may be different to what the cockpit altimeter shows. Below it, you'll find a flight path angle, which shows you the rate of descent or ascent in degrees. Further below that, you will find the radar altimeter, which shows the exact altitude over the ground up to 5,000 feet. If you are higher, it will just display four X's. Any questions? You mentioned different master modes. How do you switch between those? Okay, when you get these switches set to the on position, you can cycle through the five different master HUD modes using the master mode control button on the stick. These are nav for navigation, gun, CCIP and CCRP release modes, and finally, air to air. The last one is enabled when you hold the button for a few seconds. Ready to move on. Okay, with speed and altitude covered, we need to move on. Make sure you're in nav mode if you would, please. Your steer point is shown as a small square on your HUD. You'll also notice that there is a line extending from the TVV towards it. If the steer point is outside of the HUD field of view, the designation cue will change. Go ahead and turn 90 degrees to the left and observe the marking on your HUD. Let me know what you can see. The steer point square now has a number above and below it, and it's just 
sitting on the side of the HUD. And the line coming out of the box is now attached to the TVV. Yep. Okay, that line is pointing in the direction towards the steer point off of the TVV. This line is known as the speed line. It is worth noting that the speed line is not exclusive to the TVV and steer point, but that's a lesson for another time. Okay, so the box that is nailed to the side of the HUD is showing you which side of the jet the steer point is on. The number at the top is how many degrees off that side the steer point is, and the bottom number represents how many miles you are away from that steer point. So for instance, that box was on the right side of my HUD and had a 120 on top and 13 below, I'd know that the steer point is off my 4 o'clock and 13 miles behind me. Okay, return to course now please and let me know when we can on course. Good. On to the final part. So some more information can be found in the bottom right corner of the HUD pertaining to our steer point. And that's going to be just below the radar altimeter. The first line shows the steer point number and ID. As I've told you before, numbers from 1 to 50 are reserved for mission waypoints. 51 to 2050 are for navigation waypoints. And letters A to Z are for mark points. The ID is going to be whatever you've named that waypoint, like Benson, IP, or whatever, okay? Yep, copy that. The second line shows distance to steer point and target elevation. The first part is self-explanatory, the second one we'll cover in detail during weapons training, but for now, it's showing the elevation source as DTS. We can manually input our target elevation, which will be displayed instead of DTS. All right. The third line shows you time to go and time on target delta. Time to go simply shows how long it will take you to arrive at the steer point with your current speed. Time on target delta will only work if you have set the desired time on target, which is something we're going to be covering tomorrow. Looks like tomorrow's sortie will be pretty intensive. Yes, we'll do a lot of practical exercises. On the ground, you'll build your own flight plan, and then in the air, we'll practice waypoint attributes, creating new waypoints and mark points, changing anchor points, and using the desired time on target function. I can't wait. Just make sure you're well prepared and read all the operating manuals for navigation, okay? Yeah, copy. Okay, the last line shows the current time, but it can also be used for a time hack. It is a good way to see kind of actions with other assets combination with desired time on target or separately. However, it's a bit counterintuitive when you use it for the first time, so let's go through the process before trying it out. Ready? All right, I'm ready. We will do a one minute hack, so press the hack button once and type zero one zero zero on your and then press enter on your USD. Once you do that, press hack again to return to the normal mode. The system will now remember the last value you put in, so if you press the hack button again, it will show it on the HUD and immediately start counting down in the background. In the remaining time, you should press enter. If you want to start over, press hack again. Are you following? Could you repeat the last part for me, please? We will do a one minute hack. So press the hack button once and type zero one zero zero on your keypad. Then press enter on your USB. Once you do that, press hack again to return to normal mode. The system will now remember the last value you put in. 
Now if you press the hack button again, it will show it on the HUD and immediately start counting down in the background. If you're remaining time, you should press enter. If you want to start over, press hack again. Are you following? Okay, good to go. All right, three, two, one, pack. Okay, when we get to zero, I will change the formation to trail, meaning that I'll go behind you, okay? Sounds fun. Alright, to return to normal mode, press the hack button again. Hey, good job today, Kermit. Alright, time to go home. Biff, when we were going through the HUD, you said that you've been told that there was no big difference between the A and the Charlie. So, have you not flown on the A's before? Uh, negative. I started with Charlie here in Nellis when they were testing them. It's a couple of the experienced Alpha drivers, but also some of the new pilots. Yeah, I know they were tested in Nevada. I also heard a lot about the A+. Plus. Yeah, I heard that as well. Some kind of project going on in parallel with by the National Guard, right? A firm. It's a longer story, though. Hold that thought. I need to clear us out of this airspace. Stand by one. Blackjack, double one is west of MOPA, looking to exit the training area and join the approach for Nellis. Sure, happy to do so. And copy about the approach procedure. Let me check the current ATIS and then let's contact approach. Let me know when you're ready. Raj. Two standing by on approach. One. 
One copy. Acknowledge receipt of information like an advised aircraft type on first contact. Nellis Air Force Base information like time 0155. Wind 028 and 10. Visibility greater than 10. Approach Devil 1 west of Moapa inbound for landing with information Mike. Devil 1 approach, radar contact, continue inbound, expect a visual for 21 left. Continue inbound for runway 21 left, Devil 1. Devil 1, descend and maintain 5,000. Descend and maintain 5,000, Devil 1.
Warning, autopilot. Altitude, altitude. Safe on the deck. Raj, taxi back to thunder and I'll catch up with you there. Devil 1 1 contact ground on 
Yeah, see ya, boss. And thanks.
Alpha Charlie, 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 Alpha Charlie,